I think it's fair to say that for many, if not most, Christians, the uh, minor prophets are not a section of Scripture that they are overly familiar with. Can you name the minor prophets? And even if you can, do you know what each of them wrote about? Yeah, except for maybe Jonah. These books inhabit a pretty obscure section in the middle of our Bibles. Pages may be even stuck together from lack of use. Even what we call them, the minor prophets, suggests they're less significant. But for the next three episodes of the Discover the Word podcast, we'd like to help change that assumption in your mind that the minor prophets are minor, not very important, by giving you some solid reasons why they deserve to be far better known than they are. And because in the Hebrew Bible, these writings are collected into a single book known as the Twelve, which is a less negative sounding name than the Minor Prophets. That's what we're going to call this study, the Twelve. Join us as we explore the stunning array of diverse literary styles and techniques that the Twelve use to contribute to the story of the Bible. It's a piece of the story that we really do need to hear today. So discover the word with us. Welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. Around the table with you for these next three episodes of the podcast, studying the minor prophets, will be Bill Crowder, Elisa Morgan, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. And so here is our plan for how this study will go. First, we'll just kind of introduce or reintroduce ourselves to what a prophet is and why we should pay more attention to the Twelve. And then we'll begin to walk our way through each of the books and in a little over 10 minutes each, do kind of a summary overview of all 12. And then in the last couple segments of the third podcast, then we'll take some time to reflect back on how they fit together into the bigger story the Bible is telling. I'm pretty excited about being able to do this together with you. So let's get started. And to begin, here's Bill, who will be leading us on this journey through the twelve. Do you like the familiar or do you prefer to explore new things? Totally depends what it is. If it's my bed, I love the familiar. Um, (laughs) I'd rather sleep in my bed than any hotel or anything like that. But it's also fun to travel and to experience new places. And in that way, it's unfamiliar. Same. I, I like both. I really do. I love my routine. I love hanging out with my grandsons. You know, I love the predictability of the everyday life. But I also love surprises. And, you know, getting out and just exploring something I've never done before. So, yeah, both. Good. Yeah, I'm definitely on the explore new things side of the continuum. I even like finding new ways to get to the same place, which sometimes oh. drives my wife crazy. She's like, <laughs> really? She's like, yeah, just try to always find the best route, the most efficient. And so, huh. yeah, I'm definitely a new things person. You don't use your GPS and just obey? Sometimes. Sometimes I do, sometimes <laughs> I don't. I like to explore new things. <laughs> okay, okay. When it comes to something like food, my wife and I are badly mismatched. I like what I like, and I'm not interested in finding new stuff, but she wants (laughs) to experiment with food whenever she can. She likes trying new things, and I like the familiar. So this next few weeks of conversations, we're going to be exploring something that I think for many of us, if not many of our listeners, will be rather unfamiliar, and that's Mm -hmm. a portion of the scriptures we don't often turn to. And that's the minor prophets. Mm, mm. And there's a lot of stuff in there that we're going to explore together over the next few weeks. But it is a part that as New Testament people, we don't really explore much. I mean, even in Bible study, I gravitate toward the Gospels because that's kind of my happy place where I'm most familiar and most comfortable. That doesn't mean I never study anything else. It's just that's what I gravitate to. Mm -hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you ever spent much time in the Minor Prophets? And you can feel free to be perfectly <laughs> candid about this. Oh, I have this terrible illustration that when I was graduating from seminary, the president who was Haddon Robinson in those days, you know, asked me to sum up the book of Obadiah, which is a Minor Prophet. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm not sure I've ever read it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll get to it in a few days. So uh. I can't believe I actually graduated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think um, I dabble. I would say, like yeah, you know, one. there's a few key verses in in some of these minor prophet books that 
have yeah. been so prominent that I know them. So like in Joel, seeing that in Acts chapter two about, you know, the spirit being poured out. But I can't say I would have a huge handle. Mm -hmm. I spent a whole lot of time in the other chapters sure. or in Amos when it talks about justice or things like that. Like there have been yeah. these key kind of classic verses, yeah. right? Micah 6, 8. Yeah. But as a whole, can't say I hang out there a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's hard. It's like you have to know huh? so much history. Yeah. You have to know so yeah. much like imagery. It's a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. I, w I would agree. All the metaphors, it's so easy to get lost in the minor prophets and they're not less important, but we kind of treat them like minor prophets yeah. <laughs> in one way where it's like, ah, well, I, I like to focus on the majors, <laughs> not the minors. Yeah. And I've actually talked to people before who said, why should we even bother with the minor prophets? I mean, that's all just mm -hmm. literally ancient history. Why even bother yeah. with it? And just to kind of get us kickstarted, I'll give you two reasons why we should pay attention to the minor prophets. First reason is because they're scripture. And Paul told Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It may hmm. not be automatically on the front surface of things why it's profitable, but in a sense, it's our job as Bible students to discover what makes it profitable. And then the second reason is because this was part of the Bible that Jesus had and preached and taught mm -hmm. from, and he quoted a number of times from the minor prophets. So why don't we just kind of start right there? If one of you would read Hosea 6, verse 6, and then another one get Matthew 9, verse 13. I can read Hosea. Okay. Uh, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Okay. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Okay. Who's got Matthew 9, 13? I've got it. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so here, in one of his earliest encounters with the religious leaders, which was a relationship that I think we can say was... Complicated? In, yeah, it was baked <laughs> in friction. Uh, in one of his first encounters with them, he makes his point by quoting one of the minor prophets. He also quoted Malachi 3, verse 1, and he used Jonah, who's probably the most familiar of the minor prophets to us. Yeah. He used Jonah as a picture of his coming resurrection. And so Jesus leaned into the minor prophets and found value there. And I think for that reason and the fact that it's spirit-inspired scripture, it's reason for us to give attention to it and try to see what we can make of it. I wonder if it'd be helpful, Bill, just to kind of define what a prophet is first, even before... We go into minor prophets because I feel like today we talk about prophecy, prophets, that, that yeah, type of language in a, sure. maybe a different way than they would have in the Old Testament. So how would you kind of describe first who and what a prophet was in this context? Well, you're right. When we, in our culture, think about prophets and prophecy, we think about somebody telling the future. Mm -hmm. And to be certain, there is a component of that especially in the Old Testament prophets. You've already mentioned Rasul Joel chapter 2, where Joel talks about the Spirit being poured out, and that, in a sense, speaking in advance of what would happen in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And Peter pointed that out in his Pentecost message. So there can be a telling the future component to it, but most of the time to prophesy was to just make a proclamation. It was to declare something and the prophets, whether the major prophets or the minor prophets, were usually making a proclamation to someone about where they had fallen into sin and needed to repent in order to receive mercy and forgiveness. Does that help any? Yeah, it does. I think I'm also thinking of how there's like the accusation and the call to repentance, but then yeah. there's also like the glimmers of hope yep. throughout too. Yeah. And then I feel like the prophets are also the ones that maybe embody the message in their bodies the most because <laughs> they often have a very interesting experience, whether it's like mm -hmm. building a city and laying down next to it for a long time or cooking over poop and having to eat what they're cooking. Like 
there's some really weird things that happen in the they're prophets odd. too. Yeah, yeah, they're odd dudes. You know, well, I think as the Bible Project guy said that a uh, prophet is somebody who's had a radical encounter with God. And yeah. and so you picture, you know, crazy hair and, you know, ripped up clothes and, you know, eating locusts. And, you know, they've been radically changed by God. And so they feel very, very strongly that others be radically changed by God and obey him. Uh, one thing that I think is also significant is the fact that the prophets make up the minority view in the religious tradition of Israel. Like they are oftentimes speaking to the majority of the power brokers, the the priests, the king, and challenging that authority. And so that just, I thought was really helpful as an insight to understand some of why they seem so peculiar and so out there is because they really are trying to speak truth to power in the very society that they live in. Well, when we think about the prophets, I think what we need to keep in mind is that they were called of God to deliver messages to certain people groups at a certain point in their history. And those messages were messages from God. They were, as sometimes the prophets even say, the word of the Lord to those Mm -hmm. people at that time. And when it comes to the major versus minor, What's the difference? Why is one major and the other minor? Is it less important? It has a lot to do with size. Um, In fact, the minor prophets are sometimes called the 12. And when you collect all of them together, they're about the same size as one of the major prophets. So all of them together is about the same size as Isaiah or one of the others. So they're shorter, but not in stature. (laughs) They're shorter in terms of the length of the message. Yes. And it is, as you said, Daniel, it is interesting that they're referred to as the Twelve in uh, Jewish scholarship, because when we hear the phrase the Twelve, what do we think of? Disciples, yeah. We think of the disciples. A Jewish person who was maybe unfamiliar with that language might think about the Twelve tribes of Israel as the Twelve. So it's interesting you see this designation of the Twelve pop up, Mm. and it's Mm. the term used, as you rightly said, Daniel, to describe these Twelve minor prophets. Now, as to the length of them, just to give you a little bit of data so you know that I studied, (laughs) the longest minor prophet is Zechariah, which is 4,855 words. The shortest of the major prophets is Daniel, which is 9,000 words. So there's a big gap there between the two. Now, the shortest prophet is Obadiah. It's only 440 words, and it's only one chapter and 21 verses. So We are talking about, as you said, Daniel, much shorter books Mm -hmm. compared to an Isaiah or an Ezekiel or a Jeremiah. Uh, There's also another distinction that I think we need to make, and that's in the word writing, because these were the writing prophets as opposed to the speaking prophets. Mm -hmm. What would be an example of a speaking prophet? Uh, Elijah or uh, Elisha. They were known for their proclamations. But you don't really see them writing, but you see people writing about them. Yeah. Mm. And that Mm. is a really interesting distinction because somebody else wrote down their messages to people from God. The writing prophets themselves wrote down their own messages, we believe, and captured them for posterity and for further learning and benefit, which is why we have them and they've been carried on through the many generations since then. So over the next 15 conversations, you're going to have to buckle in and hang with us on this because this is going to be a longer than usual series, at least for me, to lead. But uh, but I think it'll, it'll be a worthwhile adventure diving into the 12 minor prophets and learning what they might have to say to our generation today. Yeah, because during their day and age, the words of the minor prophets weren't really minor at all. In fact, they left a big enough impression to be included in the collection of the Twelve. And uh, we're pretty excited to have you along with us as we explore the context and the message of each of the minor prophets over the course of the next three podcasts. Because the uh, writings of these Twelve men often do get overlooked in our Bible reading and Bible study. But I think we'll discover that the minor prophets, even though they are fairly short, play a major role in God's story and definitely have something to say to us even today. So let's start going through them now. Let's listen as the Discover the Word team sets out to understand the life and wisdom of the first 
of the 12 minor prophets. And you know what? This leadoff prophet's home life would rival any soap opera storyline. And yet even amid Hosea's personal life heartache, he was pointing to an even bigger heartache. And that is the message in the soap opera-like story of the first member of the 12, Hosea. Okay, this is maybe an unfair question to ask you to answer to a public audience, but I'm going to ask it anyway because that's kind of what we do here. Uh, have you ever spent much time watching soap operas? <laughs> I remember going to the doctor's office as a kid with my mom, and there would be some on or visiting my wife's grandma and being in the back room and the only channel that came through most of what was on it was soap <laughs> operas. So yeah. like, I'm familiar with the concept, but much time feels like a stretch. I would, I would not say that. I remember all through high school and then in college, I worked in the file room of the state attorney general's office filing opinions. And all of us would break at noon exactly and get our little sack lunches and turn on this little black and white TV and huddle up and watch what was happening on As the World Turns. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my mom and grandma, my aunts, they, like them talking on the phone about the latest mm-hmm. thing that happened on General <laughs> Hospital. Luke or, and Laura getting married, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or any of those things. And uh, occasionally if I had like a sick day or something like that, needing to sit and watch myself. But that wasn't really my jam, but uh, <laughs> but I am familiar with them. The definition, I looked this up online, the definition of a soap opera. This is a little lengthy, but hopefully it'll contribute to this somewhat wayward conversation. Romance, secret relationships, extramarital affairs, and genuine hate have been the basis for many soap opera storylines. In U.S. daytime serials, soap opera storylines weave intricate, convoluted, and sometimes confusing tales of characters who have affairs, meet mysterious strangers and fall in love, and who commit adultery, all of which keeps audiences hooked on the unfolding story. Hmm. That sound pretty close? Well, the first of the minor prophets actually could almost fit into the category of a soap opera. No mm. kidding. Because it's yeah. the story of Hosea. Yeah. And to just kind of kick us off in Hosea, who'd like to read Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 3? I got it. The word of the Lord, which came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry for the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of the and she conceived and bore him a son. You know, I don't, I don't remember seeing this verse in my Awana memorization <laughs> list, <laughs> mentioning harlotry three times. Nor should you have. There are a whole lot of Bible stories that should never be taught in a children's Sunday school class, and this very well should be one of them, I think. There are a couple of things about this. First of all, when we see the name Hosea, the first thing maybe we ought to realize is it comes from the same Hebrew word as the name Joshua or Yeshua, which is the Hebrew for Jesus. They all come from the word Hmm. Hosea, which means salvation. And that's really what the story of Hosea is about. It's about picturing God's salvation of an unfaithful Israel. Hmm. But what's really interesting is that some scholars think that when the 12 were placed onto a single scroll, some scholars believe that Perhaps the reason Hosea was put first is because the significance of his message is that it focuses on God's has said love, mm-hmm. his faithful love, his covenant love. And so it launches the 12, which contains some pretty dark and dismal stuff, if we're yeah. honest. Mm-hmm. It launches it with a larger hope of mercy and grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think what really jumps out to me in this one and throughout that kind of is thematic of all the minor prophets is there's so much evidence 
before, Israel and God are in this relationship called a covenant. They've made promises to each other. They're supposed to keep these promises. God has kept his promises. Israel hasn't kept theirs. And so God has a choice. He could walk away or he could continue to pursue them because of how much he loves them. And I think if there's no other theme throughout all these, it's the fact that God decides instead of walking away from his people, he's going to continue to pursue them even when they walk away from him. And in that way, Hosea really does seem to set up the story really well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the the other thing, Daniel, when you talk about the covenant, sometimes I would just say I have understood that agreement in almost too legal and dry terms. Yeah. But to think about it here, for God to say that the impact of your infidelity is the <laughs> same emotional impact as a spouse who's had a, a betrayal, like in the mm-hmm. soap operas yeah. that Bill mentioned, that brings the emotion and the reality of that covenant, of that marriage between God and his people to a, a much deeper degree of connection. It brings yeah. it home. Yeah. And I think in your last conversation, Bill, you mentioned that it's hard for us to sometimes understand the purpose of the minor prophets, but really the way you've just described it in Daniel Rasul too, is that it expresses the entire story of scripture. Yeah. You know, that, that God loved his people and made a promise to them and we have turned our back and become idolatrous and adulterous and God woos us back. That really helps me understand why they're there. Well, what we know about Hosea, we sometimes in the minor prophets, we can't always tell when They might have been written, but he gives us some time markers in the names of these kings. And what's interesting is, though, Mm. even though Hosea's message is primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel, he mentions four kings from the southern kingdom and only one from the northern kingdom. And some speculate that that may be because even though there were six other kings in the northern kingdom after Jeroboam, it shows that the kingdom was already in a state of tremendous deterioration. So the the focus is on the southern kings, and particularly Uzziah and Hezekiah, who were good kings, who led spiritual reforms among the people and things of that nature. So as we look at this, one of the things that makes Hosea distinctive, I mean, in our last conversation, we talked about some of the kind of oddball things that prophets had to do, like Isaiah, I think it was, had to walk around naked for like three years or something like that, you know. But none of them lived such a personal, intimate display of their story and their message as Hosea did, because it's a very, very personal story of betrayal and unfaithfulness Mm -hmm. and adultery that his wife, Gomer, commits. And so as we look at this, Her actions are characteristic of the actions of Israel. And one of the things that we need to keep in mind with all of this, and I think this speaks directly to our Christian culture here in the West, is the fact that these were times of tremendous outward prosperity, Mm -hmm. but they were also times of great spiritual unfaithfulness and departure. And I think in spite of the great wealth and the amount of we could say blessing that God has poured out upon our society, we've walked away from him as a culture largely. And I think Mm -hmm. that what was true of Israel in Hosea's time could be very well descriptive of our culture and our time as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the ideas that shows up throughout this little tiny book is that the people have no intimate knowledge of the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea of they're not intimate with him in the way that a a spouse would be intimate with their spouse. And instead, they're intimate with all of the other things in their culture, specifically idols, but wealth, prosperity, taking advantage of the poor for their own benefit, all of those things. Those are the things that they live with and know better than they even know God. And I think in that way, it's super challenging for us because we can then immediately ask ourselves the question, well, what are the things that I know so intimately that aren't good? Uh, What are the things that I know so intimately that aren't the Lord versus knowing him intimately? And in those ways, it's like, okay, that's where the betrayal is in my own heart and my own life. Yeah, I um, also think it's relevant to think about the fact that just because you have prosperity financially 
does not mean that you have prosperity spiritually. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we often see an inverse relationship of those things in right. the minor prophets in particular. And we see that with Jesus, right? I think about in Revelation in one of the letters to the churches, you think you are wealthy and you have this reputation for your great wealth, but I say you are poor. That caused a sense of introspection. Where are the ways in which I might be in poverty spiritually with God, even though I might have outward prosperity? And in this metaphorical kind of story in Hosea, which is so interesting, Gomer and Hosea have children that are also given huh. names of just being away from God. And you see this issue that we were talking about a few seconds ago of the deterioration of the relationship, generation to generation to generation, you know, a legacy. And, you know, that if, if you study our culture and the, the post-Christian world in different parts of the world, and then you see a resurgence in other parts of the globe, there is this legacy of pulling away from God. Yeah, I think all of these things combine to paint for us a picture of what Hosea's life example, which was kind of like a living parable. Jesus told parables. Hosea lived one. And as he lived this parable, the part that we haven't really spoken about yet is the most important part. Not only did he marry a wife out of harlotry and have children with her, when she went back into prostitution, she ended up on the slave market, and he goes back and buys her off the slave market and takes her home and restores her to himself. And God says, that's what I want to do with mm -hmm. you, Israel. Yeah. I want to bring you home. I want to restore you to myself because even though you've been unfaithful to me, I still love you. Yeah, and the impact that that has on generations. Mm -hmm. I love in Hosea chapter 2 when he says, and I will have mercy on no mercy, the child that was, you know, mm -hmm. kind of given that name. And I will say to not my people, you mm -hmm. are my people, and he mm -hmm. shall say, you are my God. And I love how Paul picks that same passage up in Romans and talking about the, the spiritual transformation that has occurred when we become adopted in Christ. So good. So the Minor Prophets begins with this living parable lived out by the prophet Hosea, which extends to wayward, unfaithful, sinful Israel, a picture of God's rescuing, restoring, and redeeming love and grace and mercy. What a great reminder of God's unfailing love this Old Testament minor prophet provides for us. As Bill said, this leadoff prophet of the Twelve reveals what we are so often like, but also what God is like, even when we aren't faithful to Him. Yet He still loves us, and He's all about wanting us back. That's the message of the book of Hosea. Well, in just a moment, we're going to focus on the second of the Twelve minor prophets. And in that twelve-and-a-half-minute segment, why don't you listen for three words or three ideas that you can attach in your mind to what the prophet Joel wrote. All right, minor prophet number two, Joel, is up next on the Discover the Word podcast. But first, let's take a quick time out. Now, Discover the Word is a Bible engagement outreach of Our Daily Bread Ministries. And one thing we know about you who study with us is that you are serious about studying the Bible. And so that's why from time to time we try to highlight for you some options that we have to help you go even deeper into your study of the scriptures. And one thing we think really fits you well is our Our Daily Bread University. It is an online university with a wide range of courses. And so during our study of the 12 Minor Prophets, you may want to check out some of the courses on this section of scripture. For example, one I think you'll really find helpful is called he Gave Us Prophets, and that's taught by Dr. Richard Pratt. This course gives an introductory perspective for the study of the prophets of the Old Testament by dispelling some common misunderstandings about the prophets and giving some guidelines for interpreting prophecy. Again, the university is an online platform that provides affordable classes designed for wherever you are in your relationship with Christ. So next time you're online, type ODBU for Our Daily Bread University, odbu.org into your browser. And that'll take you to their homepage where you can begin your discovery of some of the free and small cost courses that they offer. Head over to odbu.org and enroll today. 
And now it's the second in the line of the 12, the prophet Joel. And again, see if you can pick out three ideas that can summarize and make more memorable what Joel wrote about. I'll give you my three at the end of the segment. Many of us hold dearly to the idea of the sovereignty of God. And for those for whom that phrase might not be totally familiar, when we reference the sovereignty of God, what exactly are we talking about? I think of the Stephen Curtis Chapman song that's not just his words, but God is God and I am not. (laughs) I think of that. Yeah. It's related to the word sovereign or Lord or King. So someone who's overall and who Mm -hmm. kind of has the last word. And we believe that God is good and does what is right. And so the idea that he has the final word is, is comforting because he's the one that knows what's best. He sees everything. He can make the best decisions. He can choose what's good. And so that's part of the sovereignty of God too. I think about the kind of phrase that everything's going to be okay because he has things in control. Yeah. Like even when things look like they're in chaos, Mm -hmm. God is in control. He's sovereign. Yeah. Yeah. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Mm -hmm. I think we tie sovereignty, as you just described it, all of you, also to his omniscience and his omnipotent. And, you know, he's all knowing and sovereign. He is in control because he is all. Mm. You know, rightly understood. I think there are very few elements of what the Bible teaches us about God that are so comforting in life uh, when we see all kinds of things going on in our world around us. It really does seem like life and the world are out of control. But as I heard somebody say, God is in control even when life seems out of control. And that's Mm -hmm. very comforting to me, at Mm -hmm. least. And that brings us to the second of the 12, the minor prophets, who is Joel. So somebody read for us Joel 1, verse 1. It's just a tiny little verse. The word of the Lord that came to Joel son of Pethuel. Okay, so one of the things that we know about people in the scriptures is that names had meanings, Mm -hmm. and those meanings were often significant. Mm -hmm. So when we look at characters in the Bible, it's helpful to kind of look at their names a little bit, and it says that Joel was the son of Pethuel. The name Pethuel means God delivers or God rescues, Mm -hmm. which is really cool. And the name Joel means Jehovah is God. And just, again, for those for whom this idea might be new, anytime you're reading the Bible and you come across a name and it has E-L in it, that's the shortened Hmm. form of Elohim. And when you see a Yah or a Jah, that's the shortened form of Jehovah. So when you have Joel, that means Jehovah, Jah, is God, El. And it's kind of the mirror image of the name Elijah. Eli Yahu, God is Jehovah. Joel is Jehovah is God, and Elijah is God is Jehovah. And so it's interesting how the names express certain things. And with Joel, his name pointing to Jehovah as God to a people that have wandered into systemic, chronic idolatry his very name is a reminder to them that they have abandoned the one who is God to pursue other Mm. things that are not God. Yeah, that's really heavy. And I also notice, Hmm. especially in comparison to in our last conversation, we talked about Hosea, where there was a lot of historical context given about the time that Hosea emerges, the kings that were there. Joel is kind of unique in that it only mentions his name and doesn't give much historical context there. Yeah, and and we get that sometimes with a couple of the prophets were given a lot of information about themselves. With others, as in with Joel, we're told who his dad was, and that genealogy thing is such a big deal in ancient Israel that it's not surprising that if he only gave us one thing, Hmm. it would be something of his family lineage, because that was so very important. In our last conversation, we talked about Hosea. Do you remember who Hosea was? was primarily prophesying to or at Jeroboam and the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel. Now we come to Joel, who primarily preaches to the southern kingdom of Mm -hmm. Judah. 
Hmm. And there's a lot of language in his prophecy about the temple courts uh, because we see things about blowing the trumpet, the trumpet yeah. proclaiming a solemn assembly and gathering the people before the Lord, all of which would have taken place at the temple in Jerusalem. And so whereas Hosea was primarily bringing his message to the northern kingdom, Joel is primarily bringing his message to the southern kingdom. Okay. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind as well. But one other big, 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 super big, I can't stress it enough, over-the-top massive idea of <laughs> <big>? Joel. <laughs> okay, it, wow. <laughs> okay, this is big. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I said all that to say this. This is big. One of the okay. biggest ideas in Joel really is a precursor of what we're going to find in the rest of the 12, and that is the fact that he talks very much about a thing he calls the day of the Lord. Yeah. And that's going to become a recurring theme throughout these minor prophets. So when he's talking about the day of the Lord, what's he talking about? Mm. Yeah. So sometimes people even call it the day, capital D, of the Lord. Yeah. And the idea there is that for those who are walking with God, doing what is right, specifically caring for the most vulnerable, so the widow, the orphan, the oppressed, defending their rights, protecting them, those people look forward to the day of the Lord because that is when they will be known that what they did was right and what God wanted. But all of the people who are on the other side of that, who are oppressing the poor, who are taking advantage of them, who are worshiping false gods, which came with killing children and sacrificing them to the idols or lots of other really not good things, for them, the day of the Lord would be terrifying because it would be the day that they find out they've been on the wrong side this whole time. That's really helpful, Daniel. And hmm. Joel's mission, and see if this sounds at all familiar, Joel's mission is primarily to prepare the people of Judah for the coming day of the Lord. To me, that sounds very much like the mission of John the Baptist, who was to prepare a way in the wilderness for the Messiah, Jesus, to come. As Joel talks about the day of the Lord, there are two things I want us to land on. One is he uses very vivid images and descriptions, and he yeah. does that particularly when he talks about a plague of locusts in chapters mm -hmm. one and two. And this plague of locusts is seen as an instrument of God's chastening, disciplining, judging of Judah because of their idolatry and their waywardness. A plague of locusts is a pretty powerful image, especially in an ancient world that's primarily an agrarian culture. Why is that? Well, it would destroy all of their crops, all their livelihood. It's also symbolic of other plagues that the yeah. Israelites have experienced coming out of Egypt, but just basically wipes out your economy. Yeah, and I think what you said in the middle of that, Elisa, is really key because everything in Israel's mindset mm -hmm. connected back to the Exodus. And so by having a similar type plague to the types of plagues that Israel witnessed God bringing to their defense and rescue in the Exodus now becomes a tool of discipline against them because they're the ones who have gone away from God, not mm -hmm. the Egyptians who had enslaved them in the past. There's mm -hmm. always this past-future connection in Israel's thinking, looking backward to the Exodus and looking forward to the coming of Messiah. And Joel is kind of positioning that as looking backward to the Exodus and looking forward to the day of the Lord. Yeah, and it reminds me also of going back to the law in Deuteronomy 28 when Moses sets before the people blessings and curses. Blessings yeah. if you obey God's law, curses if you don't. And one of the curses in particular in uh, verse 38 of Deuteronomy 28 says, you will sow much seed in the field but you will harvest little because locusts will devour mm. it. And mm. so I think I wonder if Joel is pointing back to the sense of the covenant that they had and said, you know, what we saw God deliver you from in Egypt and what we saw visited upon Pharaoh because he rebelled against me will actually happen to you, you know, even yeah. in the promised land if you do the same. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that's really important, Rasul, because... If the theme of Joel is at some level the sovereignty of God, then as a sovereign, holy God, 
he has the right to judge sin in his universe at any time that he chooses to do so. He doesn't have to ask our permission. He doesn't have to get us to sign off on how he's going to do it or when he's going to do it. He can judge sin at any time that he chooses to. And in Egypt, he judged the sin of the Egyptians with the series of plagues. And now Joel is warning the people of Judah that God can do the same thing here because we're the ones who have gone off the rails. Yeah. I think it's important, though, even when we talk about it, to recognize that, first of all, it always comes with proclamations of mercy yeah. as well, mm-hmm. which Joel has. Mm-hmm. In fact, the way it even ends is with God restoring things, which is how many of these minor prophets end. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that all of this vivid language and all of these calls to repent are, if you respond, God also responds. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I see that for sure in chapter 2 where he's talking about don't do fake repentance where you just rip your clothes and act like everything's okay and say you're sorry and then keep doing the same things. In verse 12, it says, yet even now, says the Lord. So even in the proclamation of all this horrible stuff, even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Mm. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. That's still who the God is that Mm. Joel is proclaiming. So his sovereignty is always tied to his generosity and forgiveness and mercy and love and wanting to purify all that evil out so that what's left is the good that he created us to image when he created us in his image. And what's really good about that, Daniel, is as you described that, my mind went back to Hosea. Yeah, uh, That was the same yeah. thing as the yeah. story of Hosea. And we, again, we see this recurring theme of sin on the part of God's people, the promise, not just a warning, but the promise that God not only will judge, he must at some point judge evil in this world, But the purpose that he judges is to correct and restore, not to destroy and get rid of. Mm -hmm. So many times what we see is God not saying, well, you walked away from me, so I'm done with you. I'm walking away from you. No, we walk away from him, but he pursues us. He is God the pursuer. And sometimes he uses tools like discipline Mm. to draw us to repentance so that we can be brought back into right relationship with him. And that's the day of the Lord that God sovereignly says will happen in his time. All right, so basically three things that will help us remember what the minor prophet Joel is about. Sovereignty, the sovereignty of God, the day of the Lord, and locusts. Attach those three ideas in your mind to Joel, and you'll have a better handle on the message of the second of the twelve, the second of the minor prophets. And then, of course, remembering that Joel also reminds us that God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, even when they and we are unfaithful. That's what God is like. And we'll continue to see that theme pop up all throughout this study. This certainly isn't the last time that God tries to get the attention of his people. And I think we'll maybe be a little surprised by how often both God's steadfast love and the correction and discipline of the day of the Lord are linked together. Well, we've covered the first two of the 12, Hosea and Joel. And now it's time to meet the next in the line of the minor prophets, someone who didn't necessarily even want the job as prophet and who, by his own admission, didn't have the credentials. But let's explore what we need to know about Amos and why his message is so important. He's in the third spot in the 12. We come now to the third of the 12, the Minor Prophets, and it's a guy named Amos. And we want to dive right into the text on him because there's some really interesting stuff to cover. Hmm. Because in a previous conversation, I think, Daniel, you were the one who mentioned that we don't often get a whole lot of biographical information about these guys, but actually we get more about Amos than almost any of the rest of them. So we want to try to unpack as much of that as we can. 
Who would like to start us off by reading Amos 1, verse 1? I will. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. Okay. And as if all that is, we get it all, right? Yeah. That's clear as mud. And <laughs> yeah. we're going to add to the muddle here a little bit. Who would like to read Amos 7, verses 14 through 15? Yeah, I got it. I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Okay, so for Amos, being a prophet was like a second career path. Yeah, and one that he didn't choose for himself. <laughs> Correct. <Yeah. laughs> right. And I would suggest that no true prophet ever selects it for themselves. Mm. Yeah. If they're really a prophet, it's because God called them to that challenging task. In fact, in that context of chapter 7, the reason he's saying that is he's like, what are you jumping all over me for? I didn't even want this. Yeah. I, I, I'm a sycamore fig grower and yeah. I follow sheep around, <laughs> but God told me I had to say this. <laughs> oh, I love it. And the thing about it is, is as we've studied before, when we looked at the life of Elisha mm -hmm. earlier in the Old Testament, what we find out in the life of Elisha is that there were these things called the schools of the prophets. And they were kind of like ancient Bible schools or seminaries where where people would be trained to be declarers of truth, whatever that looked like in their setting and in their generation. And Amos is readily admitting here, I don't have any of that. That's not what mm -hmm. I was trained for. Hmm. He said, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of the prophet. He said, what I am is a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. Now that's pretty specific. It starts off in chapter 1, verse 1, a shepherd of Tekoa. How does that relate to the herdsman part? And then what do you do with that sycamore fig thing? I mean, he's a lot like many of the other people in his time, which are simple jobs for subsistence living. So the things that they could eat or drink and caring for those and providing for their family and for those around them. So it's a rural herdsman lifestyle of walking mm -hmm. around following sheep trying to find places for them to eat and drink because that's pretty difficult uh, at times and then growing things and so he's just he's just a herdsman and a farmer and probably minding his own business till god shows up not only that the word shepherd is a very mm -hmm. specific term in hebrew which means a breeder of sheep mm. he wasn't just a shepherd out following him around in the field. I mean, that was part of his task, but another part of his task was breeding these sheep to make more sheep. The term herdsman is a little bit different. It refers more to someone who works with cattle. Mm -hmm. Here we have Amos hmm. kind of doing a bit of both. I wonder also if it's a built-in critique of those who should have been spiritually attuned that God pulls this guy from obscurity, from doing something completely different and says, this is who I'm going to speak to because he's going to be honest and remain consistent with what I actually need to say to you. Yeah. yeah and I think we're not told that the reason he called Amos was as a rebuke to the religious leaders of their day. But what we do know is that especially in the book of Ezekiel, God kind of rails on the religious leaders of that time because they were bad shepherds. Mm -hmm, the imagery mm -hmm. of a shepherd as a spiritual leader is throughout the Old Testament, and the spiritual leaders of that time were bad shepherds. And here he takes an actual shepherd to be a better shepherd hmm. than the bad shepherds, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. We mm -hmm. talked about how each of these prophets in some way lives out or embodies their message. Yeah. It's almost like Amos did that ahead of time. And so now he's living out the spiritual version of shepherding after living out the, the literal shepherding for so much of his life. And we've also mm -hmm. talked about the fact that these guys didn't just take it on themselves one day and say, okay, I'm going to be God's messenger to my generation at, like it was a lark. I mean, sometimes they even refer to their message as a burden because mm. these yeah. were not easy messages to proclaim. These guys were not well-liked because their messages were strong and hard. 
the name Amos means one who bears a burden. Wow. And his burden was not just the message, but the role of shepherding that he was bringing yeah. to his generation who lacked a true spiritual shepherd. Yeah. Think mm -hmm. about, too, the fact that he's from Tekoa, which is in Judah, and yet he prophesies against the nations around them that surround Israel and Judah, but also... He goes after Israel, <laughs> which yeah. is kind of the context in which they go, hey, buddy, go back to go back to Judah. To and, <laughs> yeah. Go back to Tekoa. We don't want to yeah. hear what you have to say. But, you know, I, I thought that that was interesting that mm. it mentions him being from this small town in Judah, and yet he's being called to challenge everybody. And by the nations, I'm guessing it doesn't just extend to Moab or, or Edom, but also to the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. and as Joel connected his message to a plague of locusts, there's also a natural phenomenon that he connects his message to, and that's a time of a significant earthquake. Mm -hmm. All of these things in the ancient world, by especially the cultures surrounding Israel, which were steeped in superstition and idolatry, all of these kind of natural disaster things were seen as portents or omens. Or even acts of the gods. Yeah, as something bigger was going on. And so he links it to this earthquake. And then again, he gives us a time marker by linking it to the kings Uzziah and Jeroboam too. So yeah. we know when Uzziah reigned and Jeroboam reigned, we can kind of place his ministry around the time of the mid-700s BC, yeah. which doesn't change the fact that he's going from the southern kingdom of Judah to the northern kingdom of Israel and preaching to Israel. And once again, the message is about idolatry. Yeah, not just idolatry, but also the wealthy neglecting the poor, the poor being sold and mm -hmm. denying them any kind of representation in that process. Yeah, there was a lot of debt slavery mm. in, in the ancient world where people would go into debt just trying to keep body and soul together, and they would have to sell themselves kind of as an indentured servant to someone to pay off their debts, and then they had to work however many years it took to work off that debt. That was called debt slavery, and there was a huge amount of that in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about that relationship we see between injustice and idolatry throughout yeah. the prophets. And it reminds me, I saw this quote from Andy Crouch in his book, Playing God, that I thought was very powerful. He said, God hates injustice and idolatry because they are the same thing the introduction into God's very good world of false images, images that destroy the true images God himself has placed in the world to declare his character and voice his praise. Hmm. And so there's this real complicated dynamic where he's talking to religious people who are saying, look, I want the day of the Lord too. <laughs> and then in yeah. Amos 5, 18, no, it says, woe to you <laughs> who long for the day of the Lord. <laughs> Why do you long for the day of the Lord? The day will be like darkness and night. And then he goes and talks about it. And then you have this famous verse from Martin Luther King Jr. And I have a dream speech. He says, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. This call to hold together the moral character of God and the ethical expression of that character as it relates to how we treat each other is something that Amos is bringing to the forefront. Yeah, mm -hmm. And all that's going to be expressed in God's judgment or chastening of Israel, but it ends in chapter 9, verses 11 through 15 with a brief message of hope. Yeah. Yeah. And the language of I chose you shows yeah. up throughout this little book too. In fact, one of the kind of dilemmas that's brought to the surface is God linked his name to these people that are treating everyone else unfairly, that are causing injustice, that are showing up at worship services and acting like everything's okay, but their worship is just a joke because they're causing injustice, they're taking advantage of the poor, all those things. So one of the kind of question marks in the back of our minds as we read Amos is, what is God going to do about this fact that he's married, quote unquote, or his, sharing his name with this people that are causing all of this evil and doing all of these things? And yet even within that is the theme that we've talked about in some of the others, which is still this theme of, but I did choose you and I have plans for you. And all of this hard conversation that we're having, my intention with that as the Lord 
is for you to come back and for us to have a good relationship and for you to bear my name in the world in a way that seeks justice and shows mercy and love in the same way that I'm showing that to you. Yeah, we think about God calling Israel to be his chosen people as this extraordinary blessing, which it is, but it's also a burden. Mm -hmm. It's a burden to be the people chosen to represent the one true God to the rest of the world. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility there, and Israel has failed in that. And as a result, God is going to hold them accountable and responsible for their failings. But he'll preserve a remnant that one day will be restored to spiritual relationship with him. And once again, that's the message of hope that they didn't know they needed, but they did need very badly. message of the minor prophet Amos, our focus in that segment of the Discover the Word podcast. A reluctant messenger who felt grossly unqualified to deliver a message from God, but nonetheless someone God used to warn about the coming discipline if his people didn't turn from the idolatry and oppression of the poor. Yeah, there's a lot in that part of the conversation that should make us pause and think about how those times are like our times and we are like them. And actually, they had a really helpful three-and-a-half-minute or so conversation that followed that segment. Uh, because of time constraints, we weren't able to make available to those who listen to our daily radio broadcast of Discover the Word. Uh, Rasul mentioned how Dr. King quoted Amos in his I Have a Dream speech. But uh, then he and Bill continued down that trail. And so here is that appendix to this conversation about the message of the minor prophet Amos. Yeah, so Martin Luther King quoted the Minor Prophets, too. Which, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, and, and I, interestingly enough, the black church, there's a, a rich tradition of referencing the Minor Prophets because I think that sense of synergy or connection with the moral platitudes. Reading the autobiography of Frederick Douglass was like a transforming experience that helped me to see that my burdens for justice and faith were not mutually exclusive. I was in the African-American literature class and we were given that book. You know, you read throughout the autobiography and he ta it's pretty like a bleak picture of the church of slavery times. In fact, he talks about how his enslaver, I think was part of one of the awakening movements mm. and had this deep religious conversion and became more brutal to him afterwards. And so I was like, man, this is kind of tough. And then at the end of the book, there's this appendix and he goes out of his way to explain. Now, when I'm talking about these criticisms, don't misunderstand me. I love the pure, peaceable Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the hypocritical, slave-holding, women-whipping, man-plundering religion of this land, the two of which are so extremely different that mm. to call mm -hmm. one the other is actually libel and slander against God. And he goes on from there and I was like, wow. He had really thought deeply, and then I started to read more of his, you know, and so he quotes from the prophets quite a bit, and I think very easily saw the, we call it platitudes, mm -hmm. that were used to kind of justify some of the most egregious treatment of humanity that we've seen, you know, in our civilization. You know, Russell, as you were describing that transformative experience mm -hmm. of reading that book, in a very different way and for very different reasons, I kind of had a similar experience when I was reading the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, because in a time when the church was not just accepting Nazism, mm -hmm. but furthering its agenda, Bonhoeffer kind of stood up and told the truth. And as we've seen, sometimes they get your head cut off and he paid mm -hmm. the ultimate price for refusing to be silent about what was going on in his time. Yeah, and you know, the two of these things are related. Yeah, absolutely. Because Bonhoeffer comes to New York and goes to America and is disappointed by what he experiences with most of the churches that he goes to. And somebody tells him, go to Harlem. And he goes to Abyssinian Baptist yep. Church where mm. Adam Clayton Powell is. And he hears this integrative message of mm. faith yeah. and ethics and all this in a railing against the injustices of American racism, which he hadn't heard in other churches he'd been to. 
And he talks about how that is what kind of opened his eyes to give him the theological framework to understand how to critique and push back and why it was so important to push back against Nazism. Very fascinating connection to see those things get passed on from one to the next. Yeah, I thought so too. And, you know, you see the realities of how broken we are apart from God. Yeah. And unless somebody addresses it, we just stay broken, yeah. right? That's what Bonhoeffer was trying to do. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to do. That's what Frederick Douglass was trying to do. And all because they knew that God wanted something better for us than that brokenness. And that's what Amos was doing as well. Well, we have one more of the 12 that we're going to look at in this episode. And do you remember at the very beginning of this hour when we were introducing this study and talking about how the minor prophets are not really the most well-known or popular section of the Bible? Most Christians really don't know a whole lot about the 12. In fact, in the first part of the conversation, Elisa admitted, Oh, I have this terrible illustration that when I was graduating from seminary, the president who was Haddon Robinson in those days, you know, asked me to sum up the book of Obadiah, which is a minor prophet. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm not sure I've ever read it. (laughs) I can't believe I actually graduated. Yeah. (laughs) And she's not alone. There are a lot of us who would uh, struggle to name all 12, much less be able to sum up what each was about. Well, now we're going to hear more about why she really wasn't a great student in that Old Testament minor prophets class. But uh, she will also give us a way of remembering what Obadiah was about that Haddon Robinson gave her that uh, she does remember to this day. All right, so let's listen to the fun way that Bill gets us into this look at the fourth of the 12 minor prophets, Obadiah. Okay, I'm going to put Elisa on the spot and ask her to tell us the story of the book of Obadiah. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I don't know a whole lot about the Old Testament, and you all know this, is that I met Evan in Old Testament class, and I just didn't pay that great attention. But when we got to the minor prophets, woof. <laughs> yeah, I missed a lot. So yeah. <laughs> so you were paying great attention to Evan and not so much attention <laughs> to the Old Testament. That's cute. I love that story. <laughs> so what did Haddon Robinson tell you Obadiah was about? Okay. Haddon Robinson was my professor in those days. And he just summarized the book of Obadiah as Obad Edom. Okay. And that was stuck with me. I mean, it's, it's a great summary. Yeah. And we want to dig into that and find out what was bad about Edom, who Edom was, and why it matters to us, and why it matters in the scriptures. And all of this does. So let's start as we've been starting, I think most of the time with the name. We said in an earlier conversation, when you see a Yah Mm -hmm. on the end of it, it's referring to Jehovah. When you see an El, it's referring to Elohim. So when you have the I-A-H on the end of Obadiah, It's referring to Jehovah, and it means a servant or worshiper of Jehovah. Now, in the midst of everything we've been seeing about people who had forsaken God and walked away from relationship with God, to have your name being a servant or worshiper of Jehovah is right there pretty much in your face what his message is going to be talking about. I'm a servant or worshiper of Jehovah, and you need to be as well. Mm. It's this call to repentance and faith. And in this case, it's directed specifically to the nation of Edom. So this is where we get to figure out who Edom was. So where where do we get Edom from in the Bible? It's the other name for Esau, who is one of the twin brothers from I always get these confused. Rebecca. Rebecca and Mm -hmm. Isaac. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. The twin brothers were Jacob and Esau, both of whom ended up getting new names. Jacob got the new name of what? Israel. Is it Israel? Yeah. And Esau got the new name of Edom. And those new names became representative of the people groups that they fathered. When you read Genesis, I think it's chapter 36, you get extensive information about Esau and moving out of Canaan because 
the, the land was too small to contain all of his stuff and all of Jacob's stuff, which is crazy. But he moves across the Jordan River down to the southeast of the Dead Sea and becomes the, the nation of Edom that's located there. Now, what do we know about Jacob and Esau? Well, it started as a really tense relationship for good reason, because <laughs> Jacob, who is probably the epitome of an anti-mentor in the scriptures <laughs> of not someone you should live like him, he deceives the whole family, except for his mom, who kind of helps out a little bit and um, ends up taking the birthright and mm-hmm. that should have been Esau's. Then he runs away and he ends up having his own family and lots of herds and getting quite wealthy. And then he finds out on his way uh, home that Esau and his men are coming. And so as the upstanding good guy that Jacob is, Jacob puts all his family in front of him so that they die first if Esau (laughs) wants to kill him. But there is kind of a moment of reconciliation between the two of them, mostly because of Esau. And so they're a family. In fact, the Edomites and the Israelites, they're related folks. They're kin in that way and and live right next to each other. And nobody fights like kinfolk. Yeah. I've said this before. My all-time favorite quote is, the dream that all men should live as brothers is held by men who have no brothers. (laughs) Because I've got three brothers, and now I've got three brothers-in-law. And nobody fights like brothers, but... When you come against us, mm. we're tight, you know, and we're mm-hmm. together. And and it seems as though the friction between Jacob and Esau, there seemed to be a moment of reconciliation, but it didn't last because going forward from there, the resulting people groups had great tension and friction between them. When Israel was coming out of Egypt in the Exodus, the Edomites actually refused to let them pass through their land on the way to the promised land. And the tension between them was so severe that God had to instruct Israel not to hate Edom because they were kin. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then when the Babylonians came to overtake Judah and Jerusalem and to enslave the people once more, Edom kind of urged them on, urged Babylon on, and kind of was cheering them on as they persecuted and brought pain and suffering to their kin, the Israelites. And so there's a lot of friction and tension going on between the Edomites and the Israelites. And it even transitions into the New Testament era because the Herods, who are described as kings, Hmm. they're vassal kings under the rule of Rome, but they were described as Idumeans, which was the first century term for Edomites. Herod was king, Hmm. but he wasn't even Jewish. Right. He was Edomite. Mm -hmm. And so there was friction and tension there between him and the people that he had been appointed by Rome to rule over. So you have all of these tensions, and then you don't really see another kind of partial reconciliation until 70 AD when the remaining zealot Jews revolted against Rome and the remaining Idumeans kind of joined them in that revolt. And then they kind of fade off the pages of history. So there's a lot of really negative history between Edom and Israel. And it all kind of comes to a head with Obadiah's message of old bad Edom yep. and calling them back to the faith of their fathers, speaking specifically of Abraham and Isaac. When the Jews speak of the fathers, the patriarchs, they speak of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For them, it's calling them back to the God of Abraham and Isaac. Yeah, it feels like part of the thing, there's something uniquely disturbing about kicking people when they're down. Yeah, And that's what it seems Obadiah is pointing out what yeah. Edom did to Israel at, throughout their history at different times, but especially in the Babylonian captivity where there are clear signs of 
just them even participating yep. like gleefully in the destruction of the temple of capturing people who were fleeing for their lives from Judah to Babylon. So there's something about the sense that when we hear stories about that, of people getting kicked when they're down, we intrinsically know that we want a just outcome for that. And I think that's where this expression of God's justice emerges with the Edomites. And yet it doesn't end there. Yeah. Um, we also see that it says, oh, and by the way, verse 15, the day of the Lord is near for all nations. And by extension, I think that we can even look at ourselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And when we look at this, you know, again, it ends with a message of hope. It ends with a message of God's blessings on Israel. So even though it talks about Edom's destruction and crimes, it talks about what is darkness to Edom as light to Judah, because they have hope, because God is going to bring that point of justice that you were talking about, Russell will to their enemies, which at this time are Edom, but he's going to bless his people. And again, we saw in our very first conversation that Obadiah is the shortest of the minor prophets. It's also the shortest book in the Old Testament. It's only 440 some words, give or take, and only one chapter, but it is a message that is very, very dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of I don't really know what to do at the end of, of this one because in Thank a way <laughs> it's hopeful for Israel. Yeah. But it's kind of a, at the end of this, we're going to win, Edom. <laughs> it goes back to the whole wrestling over the birthright. It's mm -hmm. like it echoes mm -hmm. back to that. And I think, why did God allow that to happen? Yeah. I mean, why did Jacob win that way? You know, and, and here you see the complete destruction and, and it, it's confusing to me. That's why I'm over here consternating, you know, just going, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, you look consternated, I must <laughs> say. But the, the reality is this goes back to the earlier discussion we had about God's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, he accomplishes his purposes in the world that he created. We may not always understand why or how he does it the way he chooses to do it, but because of who he is, we can assume that just the fact he chose to do it that way means mm -hmm. it must be the right thing, or else the God who is fully and completely righteous and just would do it differently. Well, and, and back to Obadiah's name, meaning servant worshiper of God, even in that name, and as we've talked about, each minor prophet lives out their, their calling, you know, even in that name, there is this yielding to God's sovereignty here. Yeah. And there's a sense too where, I mean, this isn't the end of the story. I wonder mm -hmm. if maybe a way to summarize the warning here is you think you're on top now yeah, and you're kicking someone who's struggling and in need while they're down, but you don't realize what's really happening. And there's more to this story and you're, you're counting your chickens before they hatch in a way. And so mm -hmm. I wonder if part of the warning here is just the fact that, yeah, you think you're fine. You think you've escaped all this. You think that you can treat, your brother Israel this way when they're suffering, but watch out because suffering can happen to you too. Mm. And then the story goes on from here because it's not the end of the yeah, end of the story of the Bible either. But I wonder if that's part of the warning here is like, don't think of yourself too highly while you're on top, hmm. especially with the way you got there. Mm -hmm. Well, and as we wrap up this first series of conversations on the 12, Daniel, I think that's a good reminder to us too. Much like ancient Israel, we tend to equate, and we talked about this in an earlier conversation, we tend to equate material prosperity with spiritual deservedness, in a mm -hmm. sense. And nothing could be further of the truth. I mean, if you remember, uh, Jesus told his disciples at one point, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into eternal life and the disciples of me said well who then can be saved i mean they're the most blessed they're the ones who are on top mm -hmm. and it's almost as if jesus's little parable there is telling them it might look like that way now but the the last chapter has not yet been written mm -hmm. and when we read a book like obadiah we understand that the last chapter has not yet been written but when it is written it will be written by the one that Abraham said was the judge of all the earth who does what's right. And that's
That is a great way to wrap up the first part of our three-part series going through the messages of the Twelve, the Twelve Minor Prophets with that look at Obadiah. And hopefully that handle, Obad-Edom, will help you remember what this shortest of the Minor Prophets is about. Well, you're listening to the Discover the Word podcast with Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, Rasul Berry, and Lisa Morgan. Now, we've been saying that the 12, the 12 minor prophets, often get overlooked. But honestly, the next prophet that we'll begin part two with, you couldn't say that about. Who doesn't have at least some knowledge of the story of Jonah? He is the minor prophet who probably gets the most attention. But is his story really a faith story? We'll make sure you come back for part two of the 12 on our next Discover the Word podcast. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Now, Our Daily Bread Ministries offers a wide variety of resources in addition to Discover the Word that equip millions around the world with the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible. And we love to hear about the impact of those resources that listeners and readers just like you help us create. In fact, one of our Discover the Word friends told us recently, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That always bothered me, this listener said. Like Bill pointed out in the Finding Joy in the Journey series, going through the book of Philippians that we did late last year. In some situations, that verse seems unrealistic. When they stated that one definition related to this verse as endurance, well, I got excited. That makes the verse much more realistic and relatable. Well, we're thankful that that listener shared that with us. And you know, it is your support that helps write thousands of stories just like that one. And so if you'd like to consider partnering with us financially, go to discovertheword.org. Click on the Donate button up at the top of the screen. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedding. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.